We're continuing our partnership with the Ayn Rand Institute and joining me in studio this week are two of their leading objectivist thinkers, Yaron Brook and Ankar Gatte. Welcome back to the Rubin Report. Great to be here. I mean, I'm living in Groundhog Day with you guys. We're, it's, we're, yeah, yeah. we're gonna have to consistently get better, right? That's, yeah. the, that's the moral of the story. Yeah, the only way to escape the Rubin Report is to get it. You have to get it fully right. Yes. You think we can we'll do it right try. now? We'll try. We can we'll find try. out. All right, so we're gonna discuss, I think in this hour, really the meat of what I've been doing on this show for the last couple of years and how it relates to objectivism. So we're gonna talk about tribalism and multiculturalism and the oppression Olympics and identity politics and all of those things. Let's start with tribalism. People hear the word tribalism, it, it scares them. It should. It should. <laughs> yeah. Let's start there, it's tribalism. Um, the, I mean, the idea of tribalism is it's a, like a really low form of collectivism. So the basic idea of collectivism is that the group takes importance, like it has paramount importance, the individual, if he counts at all, he's just a cog in the machine that's serving the group. Collect, I mean, Marxism was a, a classic example of collectivism. The, you have a dictatorship of the proletariat, every individual is gonna be sacrificed if he doesn't help this cause. He, it is of no significance, the group is everything, in this case, a sort of political elite. But that's a relatively sophisticated form of collectivism. You have books and books and books written about Marxism and mm -hmm. why it's right and so on. So that's the meaning that at least it's based in ideas. It may be the yeah, wrong right. ones, but it's at least an idea-based yeah. system. Okay. And it comes from a whole philosophy. I mean, for, for Marxism is a philosophy that comes in the 19th century. So that's a sophisticated form because it, it's about ideas. And tribalism is, it's again the worship of the group but now not even defined by any ideas, um, uh, any kind of spiritual element to it. It's by skin color, or we happen to be born in the same country, or in the same city, and they talk about the city versus rural areas. And so, so it's divided into groups, but they're defined now by physiological kinds of things, either your own physiology or your kind of greater, but physical environment. And that's what's supposed to be so central to your identity, and that's what you should identify with. Like, mm -hmm. I'm from Dayton, Ohio, or I'm, uh, I'm uh, Asian, or something. And it, it's, like, it's really, really bad. So the obvious important distinction you made there is that coming together as a group over a common set of ideas, or, or of a set of ideas that you're arguing about or trying to refine, that's actually positive, but coming together as a, or at least the experience of that, right? I, I saw well, you, your, are, your eyebrow went up yeah. as I yes, said. Yes, because it depends on what it means to say you're coming together as a group, right? So collectivism means that the group, just as Ankar said, is, is what's important. The group is right. what's important. The individual doesn't matter. Individuals coming together to pursue a common goal. So that's what, Like in a business, yeah. or like in a political party, or like in a, a philosophical movement. That is legit. There's nothing wrong with groups. It's the elevation of the group above the individual and the idea that the individual's role is the sacrifice for the group, that the individual is meaningless, that his life is not important other than in how he serves the group. That's what's evil, that's what's bad, and that's what tribalism, uh, you know, tribalism reflects, as Ankar said, the most primitive form of that. Let's, because we share skin color, let's all get together and any one of us is not important. What's important is the preservation of the skin color or the, or the preservation of the, na the nation. And, 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 and the return of tribalism in America, the land of individualism, the land of the individual, of individual rights, of the pursuit of happiness, that is what's so disturbing and so tragic and so, I think, upsetting to, to all of us. Really. Yeah, but do you see a distinction between coming together over skin color, which I think is an easy one to debunk why that's wrong, versus coming together because you live in a nation? Not, not meaning that you have to agree on everything, but that nations exist for a, for a reason. Again, it depends on what you mean by coming together. Yeah. Yes, uh, coming together for a nation can make sense, but it depends on the nation, right? right? So if the nation was Nazi Germany, is it okay to come together? No, I mean, there mm -hmm. I respect the, the, the people who opposed or ran away or, or fought it, right? Um, but is it coming together to, to protect a nation of individual rights, a nation of liberty, a nation of freedom like America, and even being willing to fight in a war to protect that? Yeah, that, that makes sense because it's preserving legitimate mm -hmm. pro-individual values and, and, and pro-individual choice. It, 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 so it's, it's why you're coming together. So nationalism in and of itself, the idea of coming together for the nation, 
isn't a value. It depends on what the character of the nation actually is. Mm -hmm. And this is the idea that, so you're asking about coming together for ideas, and Iran's emphasizing it has to be individuals coming together and to serve their own individual goals. But then what ideas you're coming and coalescing around matters a lot. And are they ideas that are trying to develop the individual, um, so you're talking about the Founding Fathers, about the pursuit of each individual's happiness. And if people are rallying around that idea and gathering together, that's very different than if you're mm -hmm. rallying around an idea that's telling you in some way or another that you don't, shouldn't really be thinking, you should be following the authority, and, so, and that's what communism or fascism do. So it's around ideas, but it's ideas that are really corrupt, and ideas that are really pushing to the individual that you don't count, you shouldn't think for yourself, don't think your happiness counts. So, so it's, and this is why it's a collapse. Collectivism collapses from this more sophisticated form to the tribal form, because what the sophisticated forms are pushing is don't think. Don't think for yourself. And the collapse is, okay, well, if my mind's not in control and so on, what else is in control? It must be my skin color or my environment or where mm -hmm. I happen to be born. So that's what makes my now my identity, because no longer my mind that makes my identity. So to that point, are you guys shocked that we're seeing such a resurgence of collectivism based in immutable characteristics? I mean, it is it is the hot mainstream idea. Every, everything that we get out of mainstream media and out of our politicians these days is based in an idea of some, this is racist, or you know, gay people this, or th that different groups need different rights and all of these things. And it's so the antithesis of what America was founded on. Yeah, I mean, I think it is shocking. And it's, and it's both on the left and on the right, which is important. I think the identity politics are now rising on both of them, and I think. Can, can you talk about it from the right for a second? Because obviously, I spend a lot of time talking about the left version of that. Yeah, so. I mean, you're seeing it in the discussion of immigration, and you're seeing it. You know, we, we've got to build a wall to keep those people out, and it's quite clear that it's those people. Whereas I, I, you know, both of us are immigrants, so you need to take, you know, but but it's important that we're immigrants because we came here out of a choice with an idea of what America represents. And the hostility that is reflected today, and it's not just against illegal immigration, it's about immigrants coming to this country. When this country is, and I think it's important that it's a characteristic of America, is a land of immigrants. You know, this country established itself in the 19th century when millions and millions of people, poor people from all over the world came here and established themselves. So I think you're seeing it there. I think you're seeing it with uh, an identity politics that is a, a kind of a mirror reflection of the left, whether it's around whiteness. I get a lot of stuff on social media about I hate white people because I'm pro-immigration or I hate white people because I'm pro-trade. Mm -hmm. That's a new one, right? Um, you know, but it's all about whiteness. So I'm pro, you know, so, so I think on the right, you're getting the, this kind of, uh, you know, okay, you want to do identity politics? We know how to do, do identity yeah. politics. And I, and I think you're seeing it you see it on the fringes, but I think there's a sort of mainstreaming of these attitudes that I find scary, and, and I happen to think that Trump reinforces these. I think he reinforced it at Charlottesville, and I think he's reinforced it. He reinforces this. He plays into it. Whether he believes it or not is not that relevant. He, he plays it politically because it, it serves his purposes. So I think we're seeing it on all sides, and I, I find the discussion on immigration particularly disgusting and offensive and, and troubling in terms of in terms of just the language that people use and the way they talk about these people coming here as if as if they're not individuals they're not you know they're not here to try to make their lives better they're not coming here to become american citizens or what that means no they're, they're some kind of scum who's trying here to steal to take our stuff mm -hmm. and you could argue about immigration i don't think it's an easy issue but but the attitude is scary yeah and it's no. the juxtaposition of two things uh, you see this uh, Unfortunately, you see this more and more on the right. I think I think you see it with the kind of populism. You see it with the Tucker Carlson kind of view that it's it's the focus on rural America, and that um, and it's often put as the white conservatives who have been left behind. Now there are a lot of things I think that there are a lot of real gripes that these people should have, but the, it's not a gripe that. Okay, manufacturing jobs have been disappearing, and what you could do is move to Seattle or to Austin or to North Carolina and not just sit in your, the place where you happen to be born and, and complain, well, it's not like it was 50 years ago or 75 years ago. You, there's stuff you can do, and what we should be encouraging those people is 
look, you can seize control of your life. You can make something out of it. You have choices here. It's not as bad the whole of America is not like what you're experiencing here. Yeah, maybe the steel factory is closed or whatever. You have all kinds of opportunities. And there's too much encouragement of um, it's, I mean, what you saw, unfortunately, with Carlson was a demonizing of the rich people and, and things like, I mean, this was in his, the long monologue at the start of the year about um, rich people like Romney, they're concerned with people, helping people in Congo with malaria, but they don't want to help these people in uh, American rural towns. But the help was handouts and giveaways, not let's make sure they're free to move and so on. Mm. And you so, mean his prescription yeah, for that problem. Yeah, so the whole perspective was someone has to do something for these people. And you have that perspective of rural or white Americans. And then you've got someone from Guatemala who will go, who walks for miles and miles and miles because they hear there's work in America and they want to live a better life. And the response is, we're going to put up a wall? To put, it's that, so when you got that juxtaposition, this is, it's tribal. Yeah, well, it's it, it, tribal. this fully explains why having the immigration discussion, which isn't the thrust of what we're going to do here, is so difficult because you basically have people saying, you know, walls are immoral or you're racist or whatever, and we can't get into any of the nuance of there are individuals yes. like a guy walking right. all the way from right. Guatemala who wants to make a better life for himself and who's going to bust his ass once he's here versus there may be people that are trying to bring in drugs and we obviously don't want those people here. Yeah, right. and it, so there's security issues. You have to deal with those. But but the whole notion, the whole notion that uh, there's such a thing as American jobs. You know, there were never American jobs 50 years ago. People had jobs and they were competitive, and they had to be good at the job, otherwise they'd lost their job. And if they lost their job, it was on them to go find another job and to maybe move to another town. I mean, America used to be this mobile place where we move constantly in I mean, the pursuit how, of our values and pursuit of our how happiness. How many times have you moved? I've moved like 10, 15 yeah. times yeah. across and countries. Across, I mean, it, the idea that it's the, everything should be handed out. I mean, the way the, 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 Ayn Rand put this is, there's a, this kind of idea of a divine right of stagnation, that I should be able to exist 100 years ago, this is what my granddaddy did, and then my daddy did, and it should just go on, and someone's got to provide this with me. Mm -hmm. And you should have a whole mentality of growth, progress, ambition, want to change, want to get better, and th th this is, when you say it's a nation of immigrants, this is why it's a nation of immigrants, because they think of it as a place of, that's where I can finally be free to do that. Mm -hmm. And to not look at the individuals involved and think this is what so many of them are about, um, is you have a tribal, you have a collective. You're not seeing individuals at all. And you're not even looking at people in terms of their ideas. It's they're in Guatemala, I don't want them, but if they're in some, and then you might, if you had met those two people, you might think, well, this guy's way better than this guy, but they don't, right. you don't even go there. Well, it's interesting to me that people think that if you have to move, have to take responsibility for your life, that somehow that is the fault of the system. When I take the often unpopular position of not <laughs> forcing the baker to bake the cake for the gay wedding because yeah. I don't want the government having that so much power over, over a private entity, one of the, my arguments is, well, you are allowed to move. And it, and it kind of feels sucky, it doesn't feel right, but you can go take your talents and skills and worth and family and values and bring it to a place that it might be more rewarded. And that's, that's a better version of freedom than having the government come in and force this guy to do something. But this has to do with the whole notion of, of you know, we don't expect people to take full responsibility over their lives, to think for themselves, to act for themselves and to pursue their own values in a, you know, in, in a, in a long-term kind of way so that in, you know, a hundred years ago, again, and I don't want to be overly romanticize the past, but a hundred years ago, uh, you know, if an American lost his job, there are lots of ghost towns, there are lots of uh, people moved, blacks moved in mass from the south mm -hmm. to the north because that's where the jobs were, right? And, and, the, and there were Jim Crow laws in the south, so, so it was unfriendly in the south. So they didn't just sit around and, and, and moan and complain, even though I think they had a right to do so because these were laws that were mm -hmm. oppressing them. They got up. And they moved, and, and the, the whole idea of immigration in the 19th century, Jews, Irishmen, Italians, who were suffering in their homelands, got up, never see their family again, never see the place they were born again, and went to where there were opportunities. That is what made America a great country, that mentality of, I'm gonna take my life seriously, I'm gonna go pursue the best that I can pursue, I'm gonna find the jobs, I'm gonna find the things that I love, and I'm gonna go to where it's free to do so, 
And, and somebody like Tucker Carlson, who represents conservatives, the right, supposedly, right, always gave that lip service that, you know, the personal responsibility side, to go pursue your value side. But now when the rubber hits the road, they're saying, no, no, these people should be taking care of. We need steel jobs in America. Why do we need steel jobs in America? I mean, why do we need auto jobs in America? Why do American cars need to be produced in America? What, what, what value is that really about? Right? So, you know, don't, don't we want the best cars that we can get for the money? Don't we want the best jobs we can get? Don't we want the best people we can get? So the whole idea of American cars, American jobs, American steel, is a form of, of collective. So what would you say then to the person that lost that job, that's in these depressed towns that are in the middle of the country, that maybe understands the ideas you're talking about, but it's going, there's nothing left here for so me. So I say get in a car, drive to Northwest Arkansas, uh, beans in Northwest Arkansas, it's booming, there are plenty of jobs there, and get a job. And, uh, and, and, while, and if you're right now in an industry that you suspect the job is going to die. And by the way, almost all these jobs died, yeah. not because of China or not because of immigrants. They died because of robots and computers. Yeah. And they and die robot, over a period of time. Yeah, and, so right. instantaneously. And, and robots and computers are going to get smarter and they're going to get better and they're going to take more jobs in that sense. So start thinking about that. Again, take your life seriously. So start thinking, is my job susceptible to being taken over by a robot? If it is, think about what other job you might want to do, what other career you might want to have. Start going to night school and train yourself. Don't sit around waiting for the government or for some other entity to bail you out, to save you, to, to put up tariffs, to put up other forms of walls in order to save your little job because that's going back to the divine right of stagnation. That only leads to stagnation. It leads to stagnation for all of us because it, it does away with what the real engine of economic growth is, which is progress, which is innovation, which is creative destruction. This idea of constantly change, constant change and constant uh, improvement. And, and you know, constant changes in our careers and our jobs. That's, that's just the reality. I think you're basically telling people to figure out how to repair robots. The main, the main <laughs> takeaway is like, that's <laughs> going to be a pretty good job. It, that's it will be a, be a job. job. Yeah. It will be a great job. And yeah. you, you asked the question, are we, are, were either of us surprised by the growing tribalism and particularly, I mean, how primitive it is about skin color and things like that. And um, I've been surprised how prevalent it is, but you could see this coming, mm -hmm. I think so. And it's important that you could see it. And Ayn Rand saw this come. She wrote a lot in the 60s about this is where we're, we're headed to uh, tribalism. Um, because it, we had the really sophisticated forms of collectivism that caused incredible death and destruction, communism, fascism, and then tribalism. There's a middle thing, I think, and that's multiculturalism. Um, and a good way to think about multiculturalism is in juxtaposition to the melting pot. So the idea of the melting pot in America was you can, it will take anybody from anywhere and we'll keep what's good. If you can show us you've got something good, um, whether it's a good cuisine, um, uh, good ideas, a good way of, a new way of doing business and so on, you're very entrepreneur and so on, we'll take all that. And this was and, truly a unique idea that the United States, Im yes. not imposed, and, that the United States offered. But it's simultaneous, so we'll take that and we want you to discard all your garbage. So if you've got ideas about the woman's place should be in the home, so that all is not welcome here. We want what's good about you, and you have an opportunity now to discard all these shackles, not just political shackles, but all kinds of cultural shackles that kept people, you know, can't be educated, so, and or you're just a kind of a peasant, you can't aspire to any more intellectual job, all kinds of things if you come, I mean, I'm half, Indian half German, I, my parents immigrated and they left behind a lot of bad ideas. There's mm -hmm. a lot of bad ideas in both cultures. Mm -hmm. So, and so this is, it's still the level of ideas. It's we'll keep what's good and we're going to discard what's evil and mm -hmm. what multiculturalism did. So there, and there was sort of a fig leaf for it that it's true that other cultures, Americans aren't too good at even knowing about, I'm from Canada and people don't know about yeah. Canada. Like they think there's polar bears everywhere yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So that in terms of education that, okay, you should learn more about other cultures, but what multiculturalism, it, sort of that's the fig leaf. And the real meaning of it was 
all cultures are equal. Don't judge mm -hmm. cultures. And what that really means is don't dare think America is better than any other culture, or more broadly, don't think Western Enlightenment culture is any better than others. But don't think that any set of ideas is better yes. than any other and then, set of ideas. So what do you need ideas for? What's about, and so that's, you can see a movement from a collectivism that's about ideas with communism, fascism, so to multiculturalism that now is starting to attack the whole idea. No ideas are better than the other. And then it, it, it's, it's a package deal of ethnicity. So ethnicity is sort of your ideas from the culture that you're in and the fact that you wear the particular kind of dress and Indians wear saris. This is all your identity. So mm -hmm. now your identity is partly ideas and partly all these unchosen things and they and and that's a movement and then it discards the ideas completely and it's all about your whole identity is just everything unchosen. So the best example of this I think would be that every commercial now when they show you the, all the different types of people and they always show a woman in a hijab <laughs> and these are the same people who will say that they're for women's liberation. Yes. But then they'll use a symbol that has nothing to do with li women's liberation to say the least yeah. as, as a way of identifying this type of person. So it sort of is, it eventually sort of collapses on itself. And notice, some notice what happens, it's that to evaluate that the hijab is this is it's it is an instrument of keeping women down it's about ideas and really bad ideas it should be discarded that's racist but you're dealing now with but you're dealing <laughs> with something idea. that's chosen right. idea but right. it's that package deal that uh -huh. it's the, exactly the same as because you've got not a white skin color you're a little browner it's that's as, as though if you said well that's you're no good for that or you're no good this idea is no good you can't make that distinct but it's this is all my identity and this is all about my culture and, so, mm -hmm. and you're criticizing this and that's the descent into so then how do you have this conversation when you know that a certain amount of people if you say well i'm not for multiculturalism yeah. the the initial reaction the gut reaction they have is that somehow you must uh harbor racist views because we should be for all the different colors of the rainbow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's why how you communicate is important because people are going to respond that way. You don't want to, them to shut down. You want them to be able to respond to your ideas. It's why I think the way Anka introduced it, there are values, there are some values and positive values in different cultures, but there is a set of ideas out there. Call it the Enlightenment ideas, the, the ideas that were developed in the West, that have their origins maybe in Greece, that, that, that developed, but developed in Western Europe and in America. There's a set of ideas that, is, that allows for human beings to flourish, that allows for individual human beings to be successful, that allows for the best in whatever culture you are to rise up and, and discards, explicitly discards all the garbage that's out there. And that that set of ideas is superior, and it's superior for everybody in the world, and anybody in the world, no matter what skin color they have, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what origin they're from, when they adopt a set of ideas, they thrive. And mm -hmm. you, you can see it. You can see when Enlightenment ideas are adopted a little bit in Asia, when they adopted a little bit in Africa, when they adopted a little bit in the Middle East, those people thrive. So it has nothing to do with their genes. So you, you have to work extra hard in communicating to get away from the identity policy, get away from race by showing that it is ideas, elevating the discussion away from the tribe to the level of ideas. And this is, this is why, you know, part of why it's, it was in the cards in the sense in the 60s is that we diminish the importance of ideas generally, we diminish mm -hmm. the importance of thinking, we diminish the importance of reason, and we diminish the importance of free will. So if you take away free will from people, if they don't have a choice, then what are we? We're just a product of our genes. And mm -hmm. our genes happen to be white genes, yeah. right? And somebody right. who's got dark skin has slightly different genes than me. So maybe his ideas are different. Maybe what's <laughs> true for him is diff it's truly di uh, different than what's true for me because we're different human beings. But so reintroducing free will into the debate. Okay, so that's where I wanted yeah, to go with this. Reintroducing choice into the debate, reintroducing ideas, philosophy into the debate, and showing how philosophy and ideas and will is what shapes the world. 
that's how you get around these issues, elevating the debate to the level of, of, of a philosophy. All right, so I want to give you a chance to jump on the free will part of this, because when we did our one-on-one, -on -one, that's mm -hmm. really the, the right. meat of it right there. So how is your ability to choose the key to this? I think this is, so I think the Enlightenment period was the greatest period in, in Western history. Um, it builds on the achievements in Greece and Rome, but it, it brings new ideas and a new perspective on the individual. And part of it, it, it really for the first time, sees an individual as an individual. And that's, it has a kind of view. It's, it's not completely worked out. And there's some kind of vulnerabilities that make, in the 19th century, you get anti-enlightenment intellectual forces. But in the Enlightenment period, 17th and 18th century, you get a view that the individual's in control of his mind. He can think for himself. And it's not, he's not a product in ter terms of thinking about his mind. His body might be in certain ways a product of his environment of his genes. But his mind, he can take control. One of the metaphors in objectivism is you can seize the reins of your mind, like a horse is galloping, and take control and direct where it's going, and to, to direct it towards trying to learn the truth and trying to learn what is good. And so the Enlightenment period has a view that everybody can be educated. It's the first time you really get the idea that no matter you're born a peasant, you're born in poverty, you've never, your parents have never, and, and their grandparents and grandparents have never learned to read, you can learn to read. You, and, but it's because you can exert this effort. And so, and so there was this idea that the individual can learn, he can think for himself, he can produce then. And who knows what he, a, a kind of lowly individual is able to do. And part of what the 19th century is, it's you get all these people who in past centuries would have been relegated to the farms and to slaves and, and servants and so on, all of a sudden free. Mm -hmm. And they are capable of all kinds of things that were undreamt of before. And of course, that freedom is a direct product of that, right? So if every individual has this capacity to reason, to think, to, to take the reins of his mind, to learn, then, then they can make choices for themselves. They don't need a king, a council, the collective, the group to make choices. They can marry who they want. They, they, they can make a choice there. They can go into whatever profession they want. They can start a business. Uh, and they can choose their leaders. Right? They, mm -hmm. they, you know, and so political freedom is not an accident. Political freedom is a consequence of an attitude towards free will. Mm -hmm. It's a consequence of an attitude towards human reason. If we can choose, if every one of us can choose, if every one of us has that capacity, what do we need kings? What do we need authorities to tell us what to, how to behave and how to, how to live and what professions to engage in and who to marry? I mean, people forget it, it, uh, the idea of choosing your romantic partner. It's a modern it's phenomenon. Right. It's pretty new. So, okay, we've mentioned logic and reason and free will and all of these things, and you mentioned the Enlightenment, and I've got plenty of books here written about the Enlightenment. Uh -huh. So did any of these ideas have, uh, any of the ideas about the individual, did they all suddenly spring up right then? Or was there anything going on before that, that allowed these ideas to flourish? Um, I think it's hard yeah. for people to imagine what it, what it would have been like before that then. Um, they certainly they have precursors, and I think particularly when one's thinking about the Enlightenment, the precursors are ancient Greece, um, it, and that's the birth of science. And modern science builds on the ancients in terms of, and they're the ones are, who first discover that we're able to reason. But it's still too much of it's uh, the sphere of the aristocrat, the person who um, doesn't have to work, um, so he can sort of contemplate the universe. And, um, but there's this view that you can discover knowledge and the human mind is capable of it. And particularly what you get that modern science builds on is the idea of a method. So the reason that any individual from the Enlightenment perspective can learn and can develop and can grow and endlessly from the beginning of your life to the end is because there's a method that you can use. So the scientific method. Mm -hmm. But that method is first being defined in ancient Greece. Um, what I think modern science really does is the sort of there's a method of logic and of proper reasoning versus ways of going wrong and fallacies and so on. That's all defined in ancient Greece. What you get in the modern period is the, unite, the uniting of logic and mathematics. And so you get mathematical science, which mm -hmm. is radically new. And I mean, what Newton's doing is not, doesn't exist in the ancient world. But it's, the, it's this perspective that we have a method that we can define that anybody can use. 
And so if you think of religion, of they won't even put, translate the Bible into the vernacular because who oh, are these hoi polloi who can mm -hmm. understand this? And the Enlightenment perspective is, no, anybody can understand science. And this is the sense of but all these truths are universal. Anybody can understand that this is true and this is good. And then what you saw in the Enlightenment period is a proliferation of salons, it's a, where it was the people who first learned the new science, they're doing like in, in like a Starbucks, you can think of it, they're doing scientific experiments that they're teaching the people coming in, like this is what has been discovered, these are the new things. And the idea that anyone can do this is, and you can, it's not automatic, like you don't just show someone a science experience and they grasp everything, but if you put the effort in, and if you choose to put the effort in, anybody can do this. So the idea of progress is a modern idea. Yeah, and it's and it's really really important. So speaking of a modern idea, then are you enthused that it seems like perhaps we're actually entering an interesting phase where people do care about ideas again? I think that for as crazy as it may seem right now, that there is a flourishing of ideas. Look at the podcasts. Yep. Look at every all the conversations going on yep. on YouTube, traveling all over yep. the world. A, a, a desire for people to think about their lives. I think there is. I think there's a realization out there in the world that that there's a dead end coming if if we don't if we don't rethink some of our assumptions. And I think that there's some of the voices out there that are completely disgusted by the way the left has gone or, or the way the right has gone, that want to elevate the discussion. They're getting a platform, they're getting a voice. I think you've played a huge role in, in providing that voice and in making all this possible. But there is this, in a sense, a kind of counter-revolution to, 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 the, to the identity politics and the tribalism. The question, of course, is, is it enough and, 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 and to what extent does it resonate with, with large numbers of people? Because at the end of the day, you know, large numbers of people make a difference. Uh, and, and, and how influential this goes. And I think part of, part of what we're struggling with is, yes, there's a recognition that that idea is important. Now the next step is, which ideas? Yeah. And, and how deep do those ideas go? For example, I think there's a, there's a real sense of distress that we feel that a lot of people writing about the Enlightenment Right, Enlightenment Now by Stephen Pinker is an example, right? I mean, it, which is a wonderful book and I recommend it, but Stephen Pinker doesn't believe in free will. Sam Harris doesn't believe in free will. Uh, and, and Jordan Peterson has a kind of a, 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 a kind of an interpretation of free will, but it, it, the, that free will is so important. The idea of reason is so important. The idea of which ideas are so important that yeah, it's great to well elevate into the ideas, we also need to recognize what is really going to change the world. And I think if we say to people, you don't have free will, but here are important ideas, we're sending a very confusing message that I don't think will resonate. Okay, so for someone will. that's watching this that might be a little confused about these ideas and is hearing or learning in college right now why intersectionality is good, <laughs> right? And, and we mentioned the Oppression Olympics mm -hmm. before. Can you explain why this competing set of oppressions, or I don't even think they're real oppressions, I think they're uh, perceived oppressions, why this is actually something that can't hold? Well, it's the whole perspective uh, is that the, if you don't have a value, that's what entitles you to consideration, that other people have to give money, time, sacrifice in some kind of way for you, but what it elevates is the, the person who um, it can't be bothered to move. Um, so now we have to somehow pay that they can stay alive or, or can't be bothered to uh, educate themselves. So now we are in charge of their education. They won't look after their health, so we have to do it. They can't save for retirement, so we have to do it. And the it's, more they won't do those things, the, the more, more we have to give yes, them. Yes. That, that's the ultimate irony. So, and what you're taking then, everyone who achieves a value, and it's mm -hmm. way bit wider than money, if they've achieved knowledge, if they've achieved uh, any kind of success, if they've achieved happiness, they owe it to the people who haven't. You're destroying these people and you're leaving, the, everything is geared to these people. If you gear a system to the people who can't think, well, I mean, that is, won't think, won't work, won't struggle, what you're inviting is complete destruction. If that's your whole system's geared to that. Yeah. And this is what is the, the American Revolution is we're creating a system that's geared to the person who's not at all like that. Mm -hmm. We're geared to the ambitious person. It's not you have to have money or whatever, but you have to be willing to work and choose and, and think. And if you're doing that, here's a system in which you can thrive. And it, there's two really competing visions of who you're designing the system for. Right, and, and in a sense, intersectionality is inevitable. Once you accept a moral code, 
in which those who have ability or, or have education or have money owe morally, it's a moral duty to sacrifice for those who don't. Because then those who don't are now going to compete for these resources. And they can compete based on what standard, by how miserable they are. And the more miserable they can prove to the world they are, the more deserving they become. The more, so it's, it's, a, it's a whole moral code based on need. Whereas the founding of this country was a, it was a political system created to make possible the achievement of virtue, the achievement of success. It was, it was if you're not, if you're not going to work hard, if you're not going to strive, you know, you can go back to Europe in a sense. It was a, then yeah. mm -hmm. assumption. And indeed, a lot of people did go back yeah. to Europe. A lot of the immigrants who came because they couldn't make it. But the idea is this is a system geared towards the rational, the productive, the ambitious, the, the, the honest, the, the person who wants to take responsibility for their life and achieve something. And we've turned that completely upside down and now we're gearing the political system and this is why the welfare state is so destructive because it creates this mentality. This is why I think the New Deal was the beginning of this politically mm -hmm. because it creates this mentality of, oh, you're in need? Well, it's our duty now to help you. Mm -hmm. And now, but he's more in need. You know, how do, what do we do now? And, and of course the need expands and it ever grows and there's always more people in need. Uh, and, and you can get to a point where, where Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said the other day, a society that creates billionaires or allows billionaires to, to come into existence is an immoral society. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's, it's exact opposite. A society that allows people free so that some people you know, because of their talents and skill and hard work and, and ability to create value, become billionaires. That's a great, exciting society. Right? She also thinks we have 12 years left on Earth thanks to uh, climate change. So we'll talk in 12 years. Yeah, 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 we'll, yeah, we'll discuss yeah, that in yeah. 12 years. I, uh, I want to add just one point, because I think this distinction is really important. The issue is not that what about the few people who literally can't take care of themselves? Um, they might have some Alzheimer's or something like that. There are people like that. They're a relatively small number. Um, it's not, the, the issue is who cares, it's not who cares about these people. Yeah, people who are making something of their lives, you'll take care of a relative who has Alzheimer's. The but issue, what do you do for the, for the true outlier cases? I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but I think that would be one of the criticisms. People would say, well, you're just going, because the, there are, there are people that have mental health problems, there, whatever it is. Uh, um, what, what do you? What does a functioning society do about the, the, those really? I think the a functioning cases? society, at the sort of individual level, if it's your parents or whatever, you. That's, the, what that's you the ideal version, right? And then the wider version is, you don't. Th these people, uh, it's unfortunate what's happened to them. There would be charity for these kinds of people. That's this is this is why the distinction is so important. If you see for no fault of some his own, he's in a really tough situation, either permanently like Alzheimer's, or just he, he's lost his job and he's having trouble. He's trying to find another job, having trouble. So you help him out for six months or so. There would be all kinds of organizations would do that, and you're looking at their as, as human beings with real lives and and potential, versus the people who don't want to take care of themselves mm -hmm. and choose not to. And this is the oppression Olympics is not all of a sudden we've got all these Alzheimer's people. Right. It's all of a sudden we've got all these people who, oh, okay, so if I say that I'm in need, that gives me a claim to everything. So I don't have to exert right. any effort. And it, it's the system's being geared to those yes. people. And what you saw in the 19th century um, into the 20th with the progressive, and this was deliberate, was that we're, you cannot talk about the deserving and undeserving poor. And that's how it used to be conceptualized. There's poor people, yeah, it's they they're, don't deserve their fate, and we're going to help them out. And there's poor people who drink their lives away and so on. And that, what they have to learn is that choice is wrong. And you don't learn that by bailing them out. And so, so there was the deserving poor, deserving of charity, and undeserving. And the progressive said, this is a moral abomination to make mm -hmm. that distinction. Mm -hmm. There's just the poor. And so now it's, it, you feel like, oh, so if you say you're not going to help the poor, you're not going to help this guy with Alzheimer's or met No, but you have to distinguish those two. And there, it, there's all kinds of um, push that you can't make that decision. It, it's really hard, though, to deprogram people from believing that victimhood is virtue, yes. though, right? I mean, yes. people have been so uh, infected with this. Uh, just a, a quick anecdotal, anecdotal example is when I was at University of New Hampshire and I, there were the, all these kids are screaming at me and one girl screamed something to the effect of, I could walk out of here and be shot. And I thought, 
This is actually crazy. <laughs> You're in New Hampshire. Yeah. You're at the University of New Hampshire. You keep telling me how oppressed you are. Yeah even though you're at a wonderful school in a very safe area and all that, but, but she needed this idea that it's possible she could walk outside and be shot. I don't know why she thought she might be shot, whether it was her skin color or, or whatever it was, but it was, I could see how pervasive it was, the need for something horrible could just come around the corner and nip me. But you see that in, in Alexandria Cortez with the 12 years, right? We, we, you know, so mm -hmm. when you take right, ideas it's the same out concept. of it, it's the same concept, fear, is an amazing motivator when you're taking ideas out of the equation, when people are not thinking, and you're trying to manipulate people's emotions, scare them. And, and you're seeing this on the right with immigration. It's, a, it's about elevating fear and then, you know, driving people to act based on that fear. So, so yes, people are fearful, irrationally fearful. They don't think about the facts. They don't think about, I'm in New Hampshire, who's gonna really shoot me here? Am I really oppressed? And then you also deny them the ability to take control of their own life because you deny them, you tell them they, they don't have free will. You tell mm -hmm. them they don't have control of their life. You tell them they are products of their, or their skin color or their genes or whatever it happens to be. So, I mean, if, if, I, had no, if I knew I had no free will, I'd be afraid. I, you know, I don't know what that even means, but because <laughs> I, yeah, I, right. I can't even contemplate right. not thinking I'd have free will. But, but I'd be afraid because how do I know what's going to happen next? I have no control over my life. That is a recipe for fear. And what you're seeing among these young people, and what, you, what is so sad about it, about these kids in New Hampshire, is how afraid they are. When I look at the environmentalists and you know, the world, and, and I see these young kids who really believe this, who, who are bought into this doom and gloom, I think, what a, what a waste, right? How sad is it that people are growing up in an environment where they think the actions that they're taking are, are, are going to destroy the planet, they're going to destroy their lives, and that they can't think themselves out of this. So it's challenging, but it goes back to what they need to be taught. They need to be yeah. taught they do have control over their life. They need to be taught that they can't think. They need to be taught the facts. That We need to elevate that discussion back to the area of ideas and free will and control and choices. And this, okay. I, this is why I think objectivism is so important for the, the sort of the, the era we're in or the cultural point. Um, because I think of it as it's the philosophy that the Enlightenment deserved but didn't get. Um, and that it's objectivism, Ayn Rand's theory is it's pro reason, it's pro science, it's pro technology, it's pro the individual, it's pro capitalism. And it views the 19th century as this was the pinnacle of freeing man in the, in the broadest sense. And you see such tremendous, tremendous achievement in the 19th century. It's an end of war, of World War. You only get that back into the 20th century. Um, and I think the most unusual of all, it's pro the pursuit of happiness. So it, you were asking, like, how do you get people out of this that they view everything is about need and so on? You have to articulate a positive mm -hmm. vision. And not only, it's important, not only about reason and science and technology, but a moral vision that what you should be striving for and what we sh when we look at people, what, how we should distinguish between good and evil is who is pursuing their own happiness and who is not. And to resurrect that moral idea and to give it a real underpinning in philosophy, that's what she was about. And she, I think she thought of herself as, I'm bringing a new moral perspective that has never really fully existed. And this is what we need. And so you need the positive. And she has a positive yeah, case. Yeah, there's no way to undercut intersectionality. And I think this is part of the problem with a lot of the discussion going on today. While accepting the moral code that made intersectionality but, possible in the yeah. first mm -hmm. place. So, so it's hard. It, so, so I see a lot of intellectuals who, who are, who are well-meaning, who, who see the evil in inter intersectionality, but can't really fight it because they're advocating for another form of altruism, another mm -hmm. form of the sacrifice of the individual to some other group. Unless you have a real new conception of morality, a, a, an alternative conception of morality, which Rand provides, of, of the individual pursuing their own values, pursuing their own life, pursuing their own happiness, that is the only alternative to, to the dead end that is you know, tribalism and intersectionality. So oddly, is there a, a bit of a branding issue here? I mean, has capitalism, let's say, which is the greatest system uh -huh. for the ideas you're talking about, 
has its freedom sort of been used against it so it's not even it's not even selling itself the right way so in other words there's more goodness happening in the world now than ever before there's a you know uh, what is it um, humanprogress.org yeah. yeah. they release studies every day there's more green on the earth than ever before there's less poverty than ever before there's less infanticide than ever before a zillion other things uh, but we don't focus on any of those things almost as a function of our success yeah. or something like that well as a function of our morality right we're looking for the next suffering group. We're right. looking for the, those in need. And the success of these people, these individuals, is irrelevant as long as there's somebody in need. And there's always going to be somebody in need relative to, 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 to let's say, those success. And in that sense, capitalism has is, is never had yeah. the proper moral defense. And so capitalism is always uh, being undermined, undermining itself because it tried to establish itself on, on this foundation of altruism and sacrifice. And it, it, Ayn Rand is the first thinker, certainly in modern times, to question the moral underpinning of our lives and to, 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 to discover a moral underpinning that is consistent with capitalism, which is the idea for the pursuit of self-interest. So it's a branding problem, but it's an intellectual branding yeah. issue mm -hmm. that it, it's, um, what's capitalism about? Well, it's the pursuit of profit and money. So that's selfish. And as long as that selfish means everybody knows that that's immoral, mm -hmm. then it's at best what you think, well, okay, maybe capitalism is a necessary evil, but hopefully we can transcend it in some point. And, and whether it's a mixed economy, whether it's, I mean, mm -hmm. this is the Marxist plate on this, mm -hmm. that, oh yeah, of course capitalism produces more than feudalism, but we're going to have some magical system where no one has to work, but we're going to have abundance. And it, we first we need a dictatorship in order to get that, and then it's going to wither away. But if the whole framework of that is okay, yeah, but capitalism's evil, so why don't we try something else? And maybe it will work, who knows? If that whole atmosphere exists, you're never gonna have a real defense of capital, because a defense has to be, this is moral. And what you saw in the 19th century, this is, it's, so why it's just, it's branding, but like branding on stilts <laughs> yeah, sort of yeah. issue. The, the 19th century is progress on every measure of human life. It's exploding, populations, so the world population from when you go from 1800 to 1900, way, way higher. Quality of life, that not everyone's now working in farms, they're starting to have leisure time, people going on vacations and so on. Um, weekends. They, weekends, you have access yeah. to art that you didn't have before. Um, the, then if you're talking about technology, of um, you get electricity, telegraph, so anything you look at, it's tremendous, 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 unprecedented progress. What do people think about the 19th century? It's robber barons, and mm. there were child the children in factories. And so Their view is that it's a complete negative. And that's the educational system, but deliberately has obscured the history of capitalism. So it's, it's yeah, it doesn't have good branding, but nobody knows anything about it. And it's been demonized on every level. And because so, it's, the, the essence is, it's selfish. So? How do we fix that beyond this? Well, the only way to fix it is education, education, education. Speaking up is, is educating people about the history, educating about people about what capitalism actually means. I mean, so many people don't understand that capitalism really is the system of freedom. It's a system that leaves individuals free to pursue their own values. It's a system of protecting their rights, their right to protecting them from coercion. So capitalism and freedom are, are, are really the same thing politically and, and, and from a social construct. And they don't understand where profits come from. They don't understand why profit is, is moral, why profit is virtuous. But underpinning all this is you have to have this moral revolution. You, you have to have a change in the way people think about what a good life means, what being a good human being means, what, what, what thriving as a human being means. And there's no shortcuts, right? You, you can't Again, if you believe in free will, yeah. then you've got to convince people. You've got to you've got to discuss it. You've got to present the ideas. You've got to educate them, and you've got to engage in the in the battle of ideas that is, that is ongoing. Is there any system for all the shortcomings that we might have as a moral foundation of what we've sold as capitalism in the United States? Is there any system that's doing it better right now? 
in terms of the United it, States today? Well, in terms of in terms of capitalism and freedom and, and the basic ideas yeah. of the individual and everything else we've talked about here, is there any system that you know of that's doing it any better than the United no. States right no. now? No. No. And it's important to get what the, the essence of capitalism is the recognition of an individual's rights. So it's a system that takes seriously the declaration of independence. And each individual has a right to life, liberty, property would have been in there if not for slavery, which I want to come to because it's a huge issue, yeah. um, and the pursuit of happiness. And to the extent that things have gotten better since the declaration of independence, and things on all kinds of scales, as we've been talking about, have gotten better. It's because rights have been taken seriously. Um, so that on the issue of slavery, that look, slavery and the Declaration of Independence are incompatible. It's a huge black mark that mm -hmm. the America allowed slavery. If we're taking the Declaration seriously, we have to abolish this. A person has a right to life and has a right to liberty. Doesn't matter his skin color. And this is part of the whole argument that the abolitionists were making. Mm -hmm. And like a Frederick Douglass is, if you take the Declaration of Independence seriously, you have to abolish slavery, which is true. Or if you're thinking about the women's vote, it is it's an mm -hmm. individual has a right to life and a right to liberty and to think for themselves and then have political, choose their political representative. It's not about a male. or a, So it's a recognition of rights, and to the extent they're recognized, you get progress. And what happened, in particular in regard to capitalism, and why it's sort of we've had some progress and gone backwards in all kinds of ways, what was the right that was particularly attacked was the right to property. And if you think of the socialist, the communist, Marx, it's what we're doing is abolishing private property. Mm -hmm. Everything is going to become public. And property rights are a crucial, crucial right. Indeed, in the end, you can't have any other right. I can't have a right to think if yeah. someone can come into my environment, blast a stereo at 110 decibels, I can't think anymore. I have to have control over the th my life, which means the property that I've earned in order to pursue all my other values. And so you're, you're, you're destroying a condition of all rights when you attack property rights. But there nevertheless still is a difference that economically, we've never achieved the growth that the 19th century has achieved in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. We've still grown economically, but because there's been all kinds of controls then put on people's ability to trade, we don't have free trade anymore, uh, all kinds of restrictions on property, things economically are way worse than they could have been if the right to property were recognized, but some other rights have been recognized and we've gotten better in regard to that. And we're way better in regard to um, um, the whole issue of color and skin color, politically, at a mm -hmm. political. But we're now getting intellectual currents that are reviving this. And if that happens, it's we're gonna get politically really, really bad things. Right, and I can sense that happening. I mean, even right now, the, the small crew of Democrats who are saying that they're gonna run for president Everyone is talking about tax, 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 tax. Yes. So it's not just Cortez. I mean, no, Elizabeth no. Warren in the last couple of weeks now, right. we're going to figure out a new wealth tax, and et cetera, et cetera. No, they're all. I mean, this is the agenda. The left has moved further to the left. Uh, they see an opportunity there. It's appealing. It's, it's, what I like about, what I like about Cortez, what I like about Cortez is she speaks a moral language. She, mm -hmm. she boils it down to what's really going on, right? Mm -hmm. The others might couch it as, I mean, Elizabeth Warren comes out and says, I'm really for capitalism. I want to save capitalism, and I want a wealth tax in order to save capitalism. <laughs> right. Cortez doesn't doesn't play right. that so game. You, I'm you a socialist. Admi right, you admire her. But, but she goes to the moral something. roots. I mean, one of the things she said, she says, for example, they, they say, well, how, you, how are you going to afford Medicare for, for all? And she says, look, it's right. This is just. Mm -hmm. If it's just, we'll figure out a way to pay for it, right? And you go, yeah, I mean, she's right. If, if it really is just, then we'll figure out, and if we have to sacrifice a bunch of billionaires in order to put them on a, you know, burn them at the stake or whatever, we'll, we'll, get, we'll do what is right yeah. if, if that's the case. But it's not just a bunch of billionaires. No, no, I, no, I, no, I know no. you were being facetious, <laughs> but we, we know it's a that, lot more right? than that. Yeah. We know it's a lot more than that. We yeah. know the economic consequences of what she's, pre, what she's advocating for. But she is saying, I'm willing to take all those consequences. Those consequences are not what's important in life. What's important in life is to be good. What's important in life is to be just. What's important in life is to be moral. And that's where the rubber hits the road. That's what needs to be challenged. That's what the right cannot challenge because they bought into that morality. Mm -hmm. And that's why the only thing that a Tucker Carlson or any of these commentators can do is say, how are you going to pay for it? Well, how are you going to pay for anything, right? So it, it, it's not about how you pay for it. It's about, is it right? It's not right to have Medicare for all. It's not right 
to, to have a wealth tax. It's immoral to have a wealth tax. It's immoral to use force to take somebody's property. Property rights are just as sacred as, as free speech. They're just as sacred as any other right that, in this country. And unless we're willing to fight for, for these rights, for the, for, the, for the absolutism of these rights, then forget it. There was a case when Obamacare was, was being passed that you know, really hit home on this, right? So, so Obamacare is about to be passed, and the, and the head of the International Committee writes an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about how he's against Obamacare. It's socialized medicine. It's terrible. It's going to destroy medicine in America. And what we really need to focus on is protecting Medicare, and Medicare is a must, and we need to beef up Medicare and make sure Medicare is a course. And next morning, he's on NPR, and the guy on NPR says, so you want to protect Medicare? And the guy said, absolutely, we're pro Medicare. And he says, but Medicare is socialized medicine for people over 65. Why is socialized medicine okay for people over 65 and, and not okay for people under 65? And the guy had and, no answer. So either you defend property mm -hmm. rights, either you stand on principle, either you defend capitalism, free right. markets, or you're going to lose. Yeah. And that's what the right hasn't learned from its history over the last hundred years. The, to the extent that they even believe in capitalism, many of them right. don't anymore. So, to the extent that they believe in free market, they, if they can't defend it morally, they will lose every single time. So then what yeah. do you do about sort of what would be like a needed inter intermediary step if you were to roll back some of these things that you, that you don't like, some of the regulations yeah. and, mm -hmm. and all of that, mm -hmm. that you'd, be, you'd end up sort of short-term hurting a lot of people, let's say, even if long-term. Do, do you have any responsibility then? Sure. And, and it's hard. It's not easy, and, and yeah. I don't think anybody should pretend it's easy. So what do you do about Social Security? You can't just end it tomorrow. You would have to phase it out over generation two, and there are multiple proposals on how you would do that. You can't just end Medicare t tomorrow, but there's the beam proposal about voucher systems and phasing out the voucher over a long period of time. So there, there are ways to handle it where you take into account the historical context of how we get there. But the fact is that the more we delay right. dealing with these issues, the more painful any change will be. And the fact also is that there's going to be pain. You know, you can't run an, a corrupt, immoral system and try, then try to fix it without people suffering. People are going to suffer when the fix comes. And the question is, do we fix it consciously in our control or do we fix it when, when, it's, when everything's falling apart and we have no choice and people are dying? So, and I think important in that is the if you're really trying to abolish it over a period of time, the reason you would be doing it is, as you put it, it's a corrupt system. So there's victims now. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not just the victims. That you make them, yeah. It, so if you think of Social Security, because it's, it's a pretty simple example, what the program is, it's not presented like this, but what it really is, is they took money from young people and gave it to old people. And not old people who paid a ton into Social Security. So it's not a savings program. It's not, that's, you took money from young people and gave it to old people. On the hope that when these people get old, there's going to be other young people around that you can And now they're worried that because of demographics and various things, there's not enough young people. We've made all kinds of promises. The victims now are all these young people who they're having struggling. It's a way of a changing economy. They're having trouble. They're, they're in law school. They have debt and they can't get the job that they were expecting and so on. And now whatever job they get, you're going to take 5%, mm -hmm. 10% of their, that they might be saving for a house or get a better education. So, and you're taking it from them and you're giving it to someone. And that is, there's victims here. Mm -hmm. So what we're, you're trying to do is phase this out with and have as little victims as possible, but it's impossible not to have any victims because the whole point of the program is it victimizes some people for other people. All right, I don't want to end this on victimhood, so give us a nice button <laughs> ending that's not about victims. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we, we've talked in the series that we're doing, we've talked a lot about happiness. And, and, and one of the ways to conceptualize or to think about capitalism is, is at the end of the day, capitalism is a system that leaves us free to pursue happiness. This is the vision of the Founding Fathers. It's, it's by taking coercion out of society, by, by eliminating the threat, the fear of force, of somebody walking into my house and taking my stuff, of, 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 of victimizing me, that the state is there to protect me from that, and it leaves me free otherwise to pursue my values, to take the risks I, I want to take, or not to take the risks, but to pursue my values, my happiness, my success. And indeed, I don't think people can be happy in a system where they are fearful for their lives, where they're fearful for their property, 
where their thoughts are being controlled, where they're told what to do, where they don't take ownership over their own thinking, ownership over their own soul, ownership over who they really are. Capitalism is the political manifestation of free will. It's the idea that you have the capacity to make choices and to pursue happiness, to pursue success, to pursue a thriving life. I can't top that, can you? <laughs> All right, this is just one in a series of interviews that I'm doing right here on the Ayn Rand channel, and there's a link to the playlist for the rest of them right down below.